Hello, good morning, everybody. The only good thing about being on after Boris Johnson is you don't have to worry what your hair looks like. It's got to be better than Boris's. Welcome to this recording of the Forum, which is a programme that goes out on the BBC World Service, a radio programme. Um, we will begin and we'll keep going, but this will be broadcast on the BBC World Service. I'm Ruthala Shah, by the way. I present a programme called The World Tonight on Radio 4. For those of you who are up at 10 o'clock this evening, I'll be there. Right, if you're, as they used to say on Radio 4 when I was a child, if you're sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Welcome to the Forum, a world of ideas from the BBC World Service. I'm Ruthala Shah, and today we're at the City Lab Conference, a gathering of global leaders who are shaping the cities of the future. Every continent is represented here, and dozens and dozens of individual cities. But in this session, we'll be focusing on India and its urban transformation. It's estimated that about a third of Indians live in cities at the moment, but that number's rising rapidly as the population migrates in search of jobs and prosperity. This is London's historic St Pancras Hotel, which for a century and a half has been the grand Gothic gateway of a major railway station. I'm surrounded by some 300 people, all of them closely involved in city lives. With me on stage are three people who are at the forefront of making India's urban experience a better one. Writer and environmentalist Neetha Narayan from the Centre for Science and Environment, Sheila Patel, the founder director of Spark, which champions the urban poor. An architect and urban planner, Bimal Patel, who's also the president of SEPT in Ahmedabad, India's leading habitat university. Let's welcome them all. So I want to begin by asking each of you a quick question, just to establish where we're all coming from. Um, if you were to talk about which Indian city you'd choose to live in, which would it be, Bimal Patel? Well, I'd choose Ahmedabad, that's home for me. Why? It's a place where people collaborate, work with each other to make the city better. I know lots of people. It's home. Home, right. <laughs> Sunitha, where's home or is it somewhere else? No, Ritula, definitely Delhi. I know. I know, very a, surprising. A city known for its air pollution and its no, traffic absolutely. congestion. <laughs> and that is why, because I would love to live in Ahmedabad. It's a sort of dream collaborative city. But the madness of Delhi, the air pollution of Delhi, the frustration of Delhi, it makes my blood boil every day. <laughs> and it keeps me going. And I think that's what's fun about living in cities like Delhi, that you believe you can make a difference. And you have to, because it's survival. Sheila Patel. We're all boring. We're saying we like the city we live in. I live in Mumbai. I was, I've lived there my whole life. And it's a city in which we believe we face the most contested space for living. And it's a city where we believe that if we can do something in this city, you can do it almost anywhere exactly. else. Exactly. Right. Well, there's an interesting start. So let's talk about some of those challenges. Um, Shilip Patel, what would you say then are the challenges facing Indian cities? What are those contested spaces? I think the first and the most important challenge we face is that our imagery is still that India lives in its villages. And we forget that from time immemorial, cities have been important areas of trade and transformation that have impact on all the rural areas that it surrounds. Yet, along with our colonial history, we've always dealt with the formal city. And we forget that uh, that formality is serviced by the informal sector. And so informality, which is now almost crowding out formality still remains outside the sphere of city development. So people don't recognize the need for that informality? Well, you have life. most of the city that is invisible because it lives as quarters, as informal settlements, and works in those areas. So I think that's the major problem of all urbanization in the global south. And I think it's creeping in the north too. Sunita so Narayan, what are the challenges? I, I would very much share uh, Sheila's sort of um, view, but from an environmentalist point of view. I mean, I, for me, the biggest challenge in our cities is our right to breathe. I mean, we do not have the right to breathe today. We have very toxic, very foul air. 
We do not have clean water to drink. We have sewage, which is polluting our rivers to a stage where our rivers are really dead. They've just not been cremated, <laughs> but they are dead. Um, they have dissolved oxygen levels of zero. And the reason why we are struggling with this is because, again, we do not have a model of urbanization which is appropriate for our part of the world, I believe. We have adopted a model of urbanization which is capital intensive, resource intensive. Because it is capital intensive, it divides between the rich of our cities and the poor of our cities. And our governments can really invest just enough to meet the needs of the rich and not the poor. And as a result of it, today our cities are wallowing in sewage, garbage, and foul air. And, you know, for us, we need to understand that if India wants smart cities, which is what government's talking about, we have to find a model of urbanization which is appropriate not for the rich of our cities, but actually for the poor of our cities. Unless urbanization is affordable, it will not be sustainable. And I think that's the message that we need our governments across the Global South to understand. Bimal Patel, you must recognize some of those challenges. Well, certainly I do. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're very, very pressing challenges. I, I come from a slightly different angle. I think that uh, if we want to self solve some of the most pressing problems that we have, um, then um, we need to make urban planning work in India. I think uh, urban plans are plans for managing growth and development of cities and for managing cities themselves. And we need the uh, right sort of planning. Planning defines streets, utilities, But, uh, but rules, when, you're, when you're undertaking that planning, yeah. what do you perceive as the challenges? Yeah. What is it that you're trying to address? If you sit down, uh, I suspect this doesn't happen very often, but with a blank sheet of paper, what would you begin with as the issue that you thought, gosh, this is the thing that we really have to crack? Okay, there are many, many pressing problems, and the key thing that you have to focus on is making life comfortable for ordinary people. And that means uh, focusing on the problems that ordinary people face. Now, to, uh, you, you cannot solve the myriad problems that cities have unless you have well laid out plans that actually can be implemented. Okay, so having a plan is one way to address the kind right. of challenges. What I want to talk about, the, the massive growth we've seen in Indian cities in recent years, which shows no sign of stopping. Shila Patel, you've got this, this uh, uh, enormous kind of migration of people from the villages where India used to live to the cities. How do you ensure then that you include that informal sector that you referred to in the kind of planning that Bimal's talking about? And indeed, uh, within the, the, the fabric of the city itself? How, isn't it easier just to clear those people away, to put down that shiny new road or to build that tower block? Mm. Three very important messages. First of all, you'll never get a plain piece of paper to do planning. Yeah. No, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so the most important thing is to first of all acknowledge what is there. And we, we have new instruments of uh, digitally mapping things, you have big data excitement. But when planning comes into a city, it never acknowledges informality. It, it keeps where poor people live and work invisible. So the planning only takes care of what is visible in the minds of the state. In the minds of the state, invisibility means it doesn't exist. And because it doesn't exist, you have the right to clear it away. Well, the second thing is nothing goes away. It's not like you can take it and incinerate it. Poor people just keep moving from one place to the other, and you deplete their asset base by constantly evicting them. So you have to acknowledge that they're there. They play a role in your city. You look at what you can do. And the third very important thing is that it's not just that people are migrating to cities. Where poor people live or where villages are, are transformed into urban localities by the change of occupation. So today, if you look at the 2011 census, there are almost 3,000 new towns that state governments have not acknowledged. Mm. Because it's a state gazette that says this is urban, this is rural. So long before a planner will come in to look at something, it's already evolved into something that 
takes enormous amount of resources to retrofit. But do you think those people in those informal settlements recognise the value that they provide to cities? It may not look pretty, but those are often the workforce. They're often the thing that makes the city function. The question is, who needs to acknowledge that? The poor know the role they play, and they know that they subsidise all of us. Yeah. The fact is that their economic value is not calculated. Their extent of poverty, which is non-caloric, is not acknowledged. We have statisticians who suddenly change poverty levels from 21% to 9%, and we all get excited. So the reality is that we actually don't acknowledge the situation on the ground, and then we don't talk about who needs to accept this, and most of all, our politicians. Bimal Patel. Politicians, but possibly planners too. Uh, how much, uh, how much, do, in a sense, those informal settlements, those slums, which may be vital to a city, get in the way of what people might consider progress, building a new road, building a new riverfront park? Okay. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that traditional planning has not taken uh, uh, enough care of people who are in informal settlements. Uh, the problem with traditional solutions is that traditional planning has thought of only the government providing housing. Traditional planning has not figured out ways in which you will expand the, uh, or create the possibility of markets functioning reasonably well so that they can serve more town market. That's the sort of reform of planning that's absolutely needed. You need planning, uh, to, you need to remove constraints from real estate developers, etc., creating products that will help people down market. Therefore, you minimize the problem uh, of state provision. That's, that's really the but key. What real estate developer is going to do that when there's a lot more money to be made from some high-end condo development with mm. a swimming pool at the back? Mm. Certainly. You, need, you will need you will have developers that will solve that problem. But like in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a market where people produce vehicles, there are people who produce Mercedes Benzes and Audis. People also produce inexpensive cars for, for, for people who cannot afford them. You want, or, or the telecom industry has really produced telephones and they have changed the lives of poor people. I believe that if we were to structure markets better, they would help in solving some of the most crucial problems that we have. Sunita so Narayan, slightly different aspect of mm. the same problem. People come to cities because there are jobs there. But if you cite big industries within city limits, there are issues of pollution from industry, not only from people. Uh, how can you control those things? How can you ensure that you don't stop the creation of jobs, but you do also ensure that people's environmental quality is protected? Well, I think both things. I mean, one, you'll have to change the nature of what kind of jobs you create in cities. I mean, cities um, don't necessarily need to have very uh, polluting industry just to get the jobs. And, uh, and, but on the other hand, I am increasingly, as an environmentalist, I'm sort of rethinking this idea because as environmentalists, we've sort of shoved pollution away from cities and we've said, let it happen somewhere else. Mm. And today we are finding that the cleanest power plants that operate in India operate next to cities. Ah. Because city dwellers mm. are educated, they're politically motivated, and they can put pressure to get things cleaned. And, you know, I, I, I don't know how many of you celebrate something that we do in India increasingly called NIMBY, not in my backyard. Mm. Not does. in my backyard was a terrible idea when there are rich people and a lot of poor people because you shove it to somebody else's backyard. But now, increasingly, in a country like India, you're getting more and more educated polit people, politically aware people. And as a result of it, if it's not in my backyard, it's somebody else's front yard. And it is putting a certain amount of good pressure to clean up. And that's what's happening to garbage in our cities today. The most remarkable example is in the state of Kerala, where um, City after city is finding it cannot dump its garbage anywhere because villagers are turning around and saying, not in my backyard. And so every city person has to think about how you can minimize your garbage, how you can compost it in your house, how you can perhaps burn it, but you 
do not have anybody who can collect it and take it away. And I think that whole concept, Ritula, of looking at urbanization from a point of view of saying, if it's not in my backyard, it cannot be in somebody else's front yard. And that, to me, will change the way we plan our cities. And the only horrendous problem is, what do you do with cars? Because the pollution from cars goes into an air, which is in everybody's airshed. <laughs> people power, then. Sheila Patel, is that, is that the way you would go? People have to speak up for themselves and what they want. Well, I agree with this strategy, but I want to go back to what Bimal said about um, who builds housing. Even today, in all our countries, more housing stock is built by people themselves, built in terrible conditions with recycled materials that has to be uh, almost resuscitated and replaced every year. We don't have technology, we don't have investments, we don't have financial strategies that allow people to continue to self-build. We, uh, we don't have design elements, we don't have technology, we do all these things. And uh, I have a friend, I don't know whether he's here, he said this morning, he says everybody in the city is interested in property, not poverty. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> And so what is happening is that there's a contestation of who has the right to use space for what purpose. And how. And the informal system, because informality is not acknowledged, it is not planned for, uh, uh, and things like that, it operates outside the law. So it makes lots of people illegal, criminal, and outside the purview of looking at providing them, of, of being in cities that, are, that, that can produce inclusive. So, so Sheila, when, when I talk about, about changing planning, mm. I'm talking pretty much okay. what you're saying. What I'm saying is that traditional planning has pegged the standards of housing Absolutely. that you have to build up to, to be legal, to be so high that those standards are unaffordable. Right for most people. As a consequence, planning has worked to expand illegal building because nobody can afford to follow the legal yes. standards. Now, I think Sunita mm. said earlier mm. that we have to realize what we can afford. Yeah. And what we can afford is often uh, not something that we like. So if we say, for example, if we want poor people or real estate developers to produce products for poorer segments of mm. the but not the poorest maybe, but the poorer segments, then we have to allow them to build to lower standards. But, but what do you jettison? Do you jettison room space? Do you jettison uh, good quality sewage links? You, do you, you jettison? You, no. you do not jettison no. anything no, that don't. compromises housing, yeah. uh, hygiene, for example. But you might have to compromise in some cases, and, 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 and I you know, don't want to... You have to compromise on space standards, for example, because if you don't if you don't allow tight housing, well, they will build slums. So you might as well allow legal tight housing. So you know, Ritula, the word is not compromise, and I think that's what we need that's to it. change, because in our very idea that we'll have to compromise something, we actually are envisioning a city which looks like London, but is actually Delhi, okay? And we need to <laughs> think about this very differently. I come from a field, just to finish this, you know, Bimal, we deal with, I'm an environmentalist. For me, the quality of air is something we are fighting for the last 15 years in Delhi. The entire approach of trying to clear, clean the back end of a car, improve the tailpipe of a car, you know, is just not a strategy that will work. And the reason it won't work is for all the reasons that Sheila and Bimal are talking about. The reality of India is, the reality of my own city of Delhi is, 15% of Delhi drives. 90% of the road space is taken by the people who drive. But, but to go back to huh. this question of planning and housing yes. standards, who decides, though, where I... The word compromise is mine. I, I will okay. insist on using it again. Who yeah. decides where those decisions, those compromises are made? Well, traditionally... Reality. Reality decides. I mean, the fact is, if I cannot fit everybody onto my roads, because if 15% drives and 90% still has to drive, I will not have road space, then the reality has to be that I will build my city around buses, walking and cycling, because everybody will need a space but to drive. And that's the reality. If we accept, then 
your question becomes valid to say, how does planning kick in but, for that reality? But, 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 but that's in the public space. Hmm. In the private sphere, you must accept the fact hmm. that when you peg these standards, you cannot peg them to a high, st uh, yeah. high standard for even individuals. Hmm. If they cannot afford it, they should be allowed to build to what you might say, lower, more affordable standards. Good planning would let them do that. If, if Victorian London had to build to the standards that today are established in London, then they would never have been able to build. And then they would have built illegally. But, but then doesn't a development in India, in the global south more generally, have to learn the lessons of places like London and New York? Surely we don't want to go but through all that again. Of course, of course. Made the mistakes once. Of course, we, we have to learn the lessons. The lesson is that when you are poor, you should allow people to build at lower standards. That's the lesson. See, we have several problems with this. Okay. India's imagery is that it's not poor. We don't acknowledge the extent of impoverishment that we still have in our country. We're so excited with our jobless GDP growth, whatever it is. But that's the image that India pro wants to project inside and outside first. The second thing is, that compromises and compromise incrementality are bad words today. They are not words that demonstrate ways of producing gradual improvement. And the third thing is that in Europe, there was a very long period of time and lots of capital coming in that allowed this transformation. In the global south, this is packed up in a very short period in a situation where the econ economies are rattling in the global economic space. And we're now dealing with the climate situation. Like, if you take the urban poor, bricks, cement, which they're beginning to use in their construction, is soon going to be more and more difficult for them to get, well, even in those terrible situations. To pick up on many of the points that you made there, I mean, a, a broad question, but one that, in a sense, applies not just to India, but mm. to many other cities, which is who are they for? Is it for a small car driving elite living in quickly built, sanitized, mm. kind of lovely parks with trees around them? And these are often the images you see of some of the, the newer cities in India, the newer developments in India. Um, or does there have to be gradual, organic improvement? You know, Ritula, in, in, in some senses, I because in, in the field of environment, we are seeing this much more clearly, that we cannot follow an urbanization pattern and hope to clean our cities of garbage, of sewage, or of pollution. And I think that's really the, the thing that is coming out very clearly in India, for instance, is if we are serious about cleaning our cities' air, then you have to think about a mobility transformation, not a transition, but a transformation. Our advantage is that because we are poor, we bicycle, we walk and take a bus. Not because of the middle class of London who have suddenly discovered the joys <laughs> of cycling, okay? We do it because we are poor. And it's something like what, Mayor, uh, what Mr. Bloomberg said, we are eating well today. We don't have to first eat junk food and then discover good food again, okay? We are bicycling, we are taking the bus because we are poor. And the transformation is, don't go through the car route, actually transform your city so that you can keep busing, bicycling, and walking. And that is about equity and equitable growth and affordable growth. So if Indian planners kept equity and affordability at the core of their planning, they would dream of different cities. A big responsibility there. <laughs> Absolutely, Vimal. <laughs> All okay. on your shoulders. I, 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 I'm, I'm completely yeah. agreeing with that. Um. Affordability is what I've been talking about. But may I just say that what we have to keep at the, you know, as planners or anybody else, public policy making, we have to keep at the forefront this idea that solutions that we propose have to work for everybody. everybody. Oh, by the way, even the rich. Exactly. Yes. No, okay. absolutely. So if you, if you do not make, if you propose things mm -hmm. that are just partisan, just mm -hmm. one side, they're not going to work. So if you're strategically sensible, mm -hmm. you accept the political reality, don't try to wish it away, and say, let's find ways in which we can compromise yeah. and ensure that you get the Audis and the Mercedes as well as the Nanos. Yeah. And, and that's what you need.
But Sheila Patel, the photo opportunities for a politician standing outside a lovely gated development with trees and, you know, a lovely tower block and maybe a little water feature, much better than, you know, standing by a slum that's been marginally improved. Well, these are the imageries. If, if you had told me 20 years ago that there would be such a huge uh, intrusion of gated communities in my city, I would have said, no, no, not in my city. But I think that's the dream of good security, you don't have to deal with the slum dwellers, all that is also part of the imagery that mm. is being sold to the elite. Uh, everybody has become so fearful of violence, of lack of safety. So like Sunita said, instead of saying, let's make it work for everybody, let's make the city safe for everybody, you do it in pockets of exclusive elitism. Now that's, you know, history will tell us how long that can survive. It won't in survive. my opinion, it's got a very short shelf life because our cities are growing in informality. There is only that much that your Sten guns outside your house can protect you. When young people, and especially that's the challenge we face, our population is young. They are, not the chil they are the children of third generation or second generation migrants. They're children of the television age. They don't have patience. They are not going to be grateful for morsels thrown to them. Okay. They are going to get very angry very soon. I want you to hold your thoughts. We will come back to those ex exclusive elites and the informal settlements. Thank you to all three of you for now. Um, we'll be back for more discussion about Indian cities of the future right after the news summary. There isn't a news summary, of course. <laughs> You're all going to carry on. <laughs> there will be when it goes out. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you to our three contributors. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>